Forgive us of our sins, love us as your children. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. What Tim have told me to take care of this morning, the title of the lesson is The Galilean Ministry. Now I'm like Tim, I want to tell you up front, hard words, this lazy tongue of mine, and these false teeth do not make a good combination. So we'll do the best that I can is what I'll do. The Galilean ministry. I want to start off and I want to read the passage, Matthew 4, 13 through 17. Matthew 4, 13 through 17. Now I'm going to start up in verses 12. Now when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capremium, which is by the sea, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, and this is found in Isaiah, the ninth chapter, verses 1 and 2. The land of Zebulon and of the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and shatter of death, light has dawned. When I read that, the first thing come to my mind is, how does it look early, early, just before daylight in the morning? Just before daylight, we say at the crack of dawn. All of a sudden it's dark. And then it began to light. You began to see something. The world began to light up. You see something that puts away the darkness. So that's what comes to my mind when it comes to dark and when it comes to light dawning. Now in this and things, John had been preaching in the wilderness. Now, as John was preaching in the wilderness, talking about John the Baptist, what did John say about Jesus? In John's preaching, what did John say about Jesus? Didn't he say this, that someone was going to come after him that was going to be greater than him? In John's preaching, didn't he say that the person that was going to come after him, that his sandals, that he wasn't even going to be worthy of carrying? Didn't John say that he would increase that this person would increase, but that I, John the Baptist, will de decrease. What did, question for you, what did Jesus say about John the Baptist? Come on, don't, don't y'all have the, the log jaw. Y'all don't want me to preach this morning, so don't have the log jaw. What did 
Jesus say about John the Baptist? He was what? Okay. All right. You're right. Jesus said that among those born of a woman, that there was no greater man than John the Baptist. Ain't born of a woman, there's no greater man than John the Baptist. But the least in the kingdom was greater than he. The least in the kingdom was going to be greater than John the Baptist. Now look what it says, as the light dawned, what began to happen in verses 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That started his ministry. And it started in Galilee. And today that's what we're covering is the Galilean ministry. Now look, all everything that Jesus done from the start to the finish was important. But there were some special things about Galilee that was extremely special. First thing you think about, of the 33 years that he was here, 30 of those years were spent in Galilee. Another one you think of, of the 32 parables that he taught, 19 of those was in Galilee. Of the 33 miracles that he performed, 25 of those was in Galilee. Galilee was an important ministry. Where was the first miracle that he done? Where was that done at? The first miracle. Canaan of Galilee, the first miracle. That was when he turned at the wedding, when he turned the water into wine. Turn your Bibles to Matthew's 28 and verses 16. What else come out of Galilee? You said it was an important ministry and stuff. It was from Galilee that he gave the great commission. Look in verses 16. Then the eleven disciples went away unto Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. They was in Galilee. When they saw him, they worshiped him. But some doubted, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of ages. We got our great charge from Galilee. It was an important ministry. Now, remember he began preaching in Galilee, and then he started his preaching, he said, Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Let's look at Matthew 9 and verses 35. Matthew 9 and verses 35. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel 
of the kingdom and healing every sick and every disease that was among them. Look, in here we see three things that when Jesus started his ministry, there was three things that he done. What was the first one in verses, in that verse, what was the first one that he done? He went teaching in their synagogue. What was the second thing that he done? Preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And what was the third thing? It was healing every sickness and every disease. Yes, the Galilean ministry was an important ministry. Look, as he began his ministry, there was one word that was uniquely used when John was preaching in the wilderness, when Jesus started his preaching of the good news of the kingdom, and, the day, and on the day of Pentecost, when Peter preached that great sermon, there was one word that was used that was unique to all of those sermons, of all of those. What is that word? What is the word that was common to all of those? Wasn't it repentance? What did John start his sermons with? He started his sermons with the message of repentance and to bear fruit worthy of that repentance. When Jesus began his ministry, he started it with repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Peter preached that great sermon on the day of Pentecost, down at the end of it, it was after they had asked him what to do. It was repentance. It started. Look, everything related to Jesus, everything related to starting this walk, or to start all, all of it starts with the first thing, repentance. John's case, Jesus' cases, and when Peter preached, repentance. Stop. Turn. Change the direction in which you're going. Now seek the right direction. All three of them started with repentance. Now, when you look at that, in Jesus' teaching, in Jesus' preaching, the healing all that he done and stuff, all of the parables that he told, all of those things, it was done to get people to understand, to get people to believe, and to get people to obey. That's everything they've done was geared towards getting the folks to understand, getting folks to believe, and getting folks to obey. Now, in the Galilean ministry, in John, the second chapter, after Jesus had turned the water to wine. In verses 11 of that chapter, it says, This beginning of signs Jesus did in Canaan of Galilee, manifesting his glory, and his disciples believed. It started, the ministry started in Galilee. 
And that's where the sign started at. That's where the first miracle was. It started there. And it was all for the purpose of his disciples believing. Now, turn your Bibles to John 4, verses 47 through 54. As you read here, 47 through 54, when he heard that Jesus had came out of Judah into Galilee, he went to him and ordered him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. This whole passage here is all about a man from come premium, I think, that came to Jesus. His son was sick. And he wanted, his son was so sick that he was at the point of death. And he wanted Jesus to heal him. Listen to what Jesus told him right off the bat, says, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. Signs and wonders was important. Jesus himself said, if you didn't see them, hey, hey, you ain't going to believe. So it was necessary for the signs. It was necessary for the wonders and stuff. Now, after this man wanted Jesus to heal his son, down in verses 50, Jesus told him, says, go your way. Your son lives. Now, after that, the man, the servants came. The man asked his servants about his son. They told him that he was healed, that he got better. He asked them about what time of the hour it was and all of that. He inquired about that. And they told him. Then the man remembered that this was about the time that Jesus told him what he did, that he told him that your son lives. But look what it says in the last part of verses 53 and 54 when he says, Your son lives, and he himself believed in his whole household. Look, the signs and the wonders was for people to believe. Here's a case here that it was fun to believe. The sign caused the folks to believe. In the next verse, 54, this again is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judah into Galilee. The Galilean ministry was an important ministry. Turn now to John the 20th chapter in verses 27. Why are these so important? What do you think Jesus had to do all of these? We start reading in verses 27 of the 20th chapter and the Bible reads then he said to Thomas reach your fingers here and look at my hands and reach your hands here and put it into my side do not be unbelieving but believing Thomas had a problem with <laughs> believing. It's unbelieving. He told him, don't be that. Don't be the unbelieving. Be believing. And look what he tells Thomas to do. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you 
have believed. Look, at that point, or point I'm getting kind of ahead of myself a little bit here. But Thomas went and put his hand in his side. He examined his hand. He did all of those. And it was the purpose for him to believe. The signs was for a reason. Now, after this had happened, he told them, says, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's the rust. Have we seen him? No, we haven't seen him. Do we believe in him? Yes, we do believe in him. But we haven't seen him. But Jesus said, Blessed are those folks that haven't seen, but yet believe. Paul Stewart last week talked about the Beatitudes. All of them blessings and things that there was in the Beatitudes. Look, folks, we are blessed when we believe in Jesus. Jesus said that. Those folks that haven't seen me, blessed are those. He's talking about us. But then look what he said in the next verses, as John wrote. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Some of the signs that he done was written in this book, but it was some that was not written in this book. But this tells us of the purpose for which they was written. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you have life in his name. Do you, do you catch that? These are written that you may believe that Jesus, he is the Christ and the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. This was a great ministry. Many things is not written in this book, but these are written for a purpose. But what Don don't me John had a way of writing things. John had a way of making his point. Look at the last verse in the book of John. The last verse in the book of John. And I want you to comprehend in your mind what John is telling us in the last verse. The last verse for John reads, reads, and there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Once Jesus started Was he busy, Paul? (laughs) You look what John's saying here. If all of them things that Jesus done, and and he done them one by one, if every one of them was written one by one, there'll be so many books that the world could not contain it. Jesus was busy. And all of 
Jesus is preaching about the good news of the kingdom. Jesus preached. And these things is what? It was what the kingdom was like. Or either it was how to live in the kingdom. In order to inherit eternal life. One of the two things. What the kingdom was like. Or either how do you live. In the kingdom. How do you live your life? Once you become a Christian, how do you live your life? All of that point towards eternal life. Now, remember how Jesus started his ministry. It was repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When he was talking to Nicodemus, in the third chapter of the book of John, he told Nicodemus and stuff what was necessary for him to enter into the kingdom. He told him that it was born of water and of the spirit. He told him that which was born of the flesh is flesh. That which was born of the spirit was the spirit. But essentially, you must be born again to enter into the kingdom. He started his ministry in Galilee saying, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. All through his sermons, all through his deal. He talked about the kingdom. Started off with repentance. But look at how he talked about his kingdom some. I'm going all right in time, I guess. In Matthew 16, 19, he told Peter that he was going to give to him the keys to the kingdom. Okay, still preaching about the kingdom. But the verse just above that, in verse 18, he told Peter what the kingdom was going to be. And he told Peter in that, that it was going to be the church that he was going to build. Now, in the use of these keys, this kingdom and things, I want you to turn your Bibles to Acts 2. Yeah, and in Acts 2, let me get this thing off of there. In Acts 2, it starts up there at the first of the chapter, when the day of Pentecost was fully come. But look, here's what I want to do. As you look down in verses 14, it says, but Peter stood up with the 11. Peter's preaching. And here's some of Peter's sermon in verses 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs. We just got through talking about the miracles, the wonders, and the signs, and the reasons for them. Peter said, did through him in your midst, as you yourself also know. You saw the signs. You saw the miracles. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and the foreknowledge of God. You have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. Whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be helped by it. Look. And then down in verses 29, it talks about 
that David talks about the patriarchs a little bit. But here's what caught my eye when I read that. And he got through, he got through talking about David, but in the last of that verse, he says, He is both dead and buried, and his tomb is still with us this day. But he just told them that Jesus was raised from it. Now, he's telling our David, all his patriarchs, and David, and all of that. David is dead, he's buried, and his tomb is still there. But now Christ has been raised. He ain't in the grave no more. He's been raised. It's something different about Christ. He's raised from the dead and stuff. Now, in verses 23, it reads, it says, concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus, God has raised up, of whom we are all witnesses. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The Galilean ministry was important. Therefore, look down in verses 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know surely that God has made this Jesus, this Jesus, this Jesus, whom you have crucified. You crucified him, but he made him both Lord and Christ. Now, when the folks heard this, they asked him, men and brethren, what must we do to be saved? Now listen to Peter. And I told you it was one word that was unique between Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, Jesus' sermon, and what John the Baptist preached. Listen to him. Then Peter said, after they asked him, what would we do to be saved? Then Peter said to them, repent. That's the word I'm looking for, repent. Stop, turn in a different direction. Repent, repent is essential. That was unique to all of them. Then after, he says, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Christ for the remission of your sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That baptism there goes all the way back to the same thing that he talked to Nicodemus about the born again. Look. Don't get all there. Listen again and some stuff. Turn your Bibles to uh, uh, Acts the 10th chapter in verses uh, 14, Acts 10 and verses 14. You're talking about Peter there. Look what he says here in these. He said, then in verses 34, Acts 10 and verses 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth I perceive that God shows no personality, no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works 
Righteousness is accepted by him. Work righteousness. Remember back even when John was preaching, he says, repent and let your fruit bear righteousness. The sermon continues right here. Peter is using this. It says, and work righteousness. Let your fruit be of that of repentance. Work righteousness. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word to you in verses 37, that word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which God preached. Galilee was an important ministry. Galilee was a unique ministry. Look what Peter <laughs> tells him up here in verses 22, I mean verses 42 and things. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judged and of the living dead. To him all the prophets witnessed that through his name whoever believe in him will receive remission of sin. Don't stop there and stuff. It doesn't stop right there. Go back down in verses 48 and it tells you what continues after that. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Look, I want to put a plug in for us right now. The book of Acts is a beautiful book. Oh, it's beautiful. The church started there. It's a lot of history. That's the whole history of the church in there. Let me put a plug in for our Tuesday's class. The young at heart has a Tuesday's class. We are studying the book of Acts. Look, we're not partial about the age limit that comes to that class. We want you all to come. Tim does a good job. He's a good teacher. And we're studying about the church. In fact, we're in the book of Acts. Don't want to step on nobody's toes, no kind of way. But look, if you want to read with somebody, a group of us Christians meet for class on Tuesday, and we bring our own lunch, so we eat together. There's a group of us that fellowship there. Yes, we visit with one another. We fellowship with one another. Important of all, we study God's word. Some of us like to have people that we like to drink coffee with. Tim and Darwin make a great big pot of coffee. And Darwin's make Louisiana coffee. It's good and strong. Look, everything is there. We'd like for y'all to come and join us in our Tuesday's class. We're talking about these same particular things right here. Now, in our study, I want you to keep in mind of this, of all things. The kingdom 
is a synonym for the word church. Or you say church is a synonym for the word kingdom. They're the same thing. What is a synonym? Go back to your English classes. The same thing. Now, there are some things I told you that Jesus preached about the kingdom. And look, and he tells us in some of his parables what the kingdom was like. He either tells us what the kingdom is like or he tells us how to live in the kingdom. What is the kingdom like? Turn your Bibles to Matthew's the 13th chapter. And I want to read 13 verses 31 through 33. Another parable he put forth to them saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man take and sow it in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air comes and nest in its branches. In verses 33, Another parable he spoke to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in the three measures of meal until it was all leaven. These parables, I think that this is a pair of parables that goes together. And he tells us what the kingdom is like in this. He says it's like a mustard seed and it is like yeast. When Matthew wrote it, he said the kingdom of heaven. When Mark and Luke wrote it, he said the kingdom of God. But it's the same. I think that when he says that it is like this, that these two parables represent two unique things about the kingdom. Remember he said, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. One of the parables, the mustard seed, I think that it represents and that or it tells the extensive growth of the kingdom. I think that the yeast teaches a point to the intensive growth that occurs in the kingdom. Look, the smallest seed makes the largest plant. Matthew says that a man took it and he planted it in his field. Mark said the smallest seed that you put in a garden. Luke said a man took it and planted it in his garden. The contrast is between the seed and the plant. When you look at that, I said it is the extensive growth of the kingdom. Look, the seed was planted. The tree is growing. The plant's growing. Look, but it's not fully grown yet. We've got a class coming up that we want is named the Evangelistic 101, Evangelism 101. The church support mission. We support pre- preaching students and all. We support all of those. We send our kids out on mission trips. We do all of that. All 
of that is doing as to saying, help this plant to grow. To enlarge the growth of the kingdom. The plant is not fully grown yet. It's still growing. He told us to go and to preach the gospel. To baptize folks. He told us to do that. The tree is still growing. It have not reached maturity yet. All started, Paul stood from a little mustard seed. Look at the east. That was the extensive, that was the extensive growth of the kingdom. Look at the east that he said. That intensiveness of it. Look. That thing have been interpreted a whole bunch of ways, but just let's just look at the facts of that. The east was added to the flower. And when the east was added to the flower, boy, it went through the entire batch of the door, of the door. The east was hidden from our sight. But yet the results of it was visible. You could see the results of it. Remember what Jesus told Nicodemus. It says, the wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it, but you can't tell where it goes or where it comes from. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Do we control the work of the, the Spirit? No. It just happens. If you take one thing from the East, take this, and I'm shutting up, getting out and stuff, and things. What the East illustrates is that the Word of God affects you. The Word of God will change you. The kingdom will change you, and it will change it. The kingdom will change, the kingdom will change it all. It's like the East. Put it there and let it work. It works its way through the whole entire batch of dough. Now my time is out. I better shut up now. Thank you all so much.